tonight, for all of you regulars out there, this is a program that's a little different than our normal event, but I think you'll uh, agree it's going to be a memorable evening. This program is a collaboration with our neighbors, the Boston Conservatory at Berkeley, and I hope it will be the beginning of many a joint venture. I want to give a special thanks to Dr. Michael Shin, the Dean of Music at the Boston Conservatory, for all of his work in bringing this program together. And what we're doing tonight is exploring the topic of the armistice for World War I through images, words, and music. We will begin with a song performed by baritone John Brancy and pianist Peter Dugan. Then our own Peter Drummy will give us a historical background on the aftermath of the war to end all wars. This will be followed by additional songs and Peter Drummy highlighting items from our collections that offer snapshots of this moment in history. Um, we usually try to keep our programs to about an hour. This may run over a little bit, but you'll be so transported, you'll never notice it. <laughs> As Peter Drummy is familiar to most of you, he is our Stephen T. Riley librarian at the MHS and a person with a deep interest in the history of World War I. Baritone John Brancy has been described by no less than the New York Times as, quote, a vibrant, resonant presence on the international opera, concert, and recital stages. Brancy is the recent winner of the first place prize at the 2018 Montreal International Music Competition, first place prize at the 2018 Court Vial Foundation's La Delenia Competition, second place prize at the 2017 Wigmore Hall International Song Competition, and the media prize at the Hans Gabor Belvedere International Vocal Competition. Pianist Peter Dugan's 2017 debut solo performances with Michael Tilson Thomas and the San Francisco Symphony were described by the LA Times as stunning and by the San Francisco Chronicle as fearlessly athletic, which has to be the best review I've ever heard for a musician. He has appeared as a soloist, recitalist, and chamber musician across North America and abroad. Prizing versatility as the key to the future of classical music, Mr. Dugan is equally at home in classical, jazz, and pop idioms. Brancy and Dugan have embarked on a national tour of their critically acclaimed program, A Silent Night, a World War, II, a World War I Memorial in Song and Armistice, The Journey Home. This tour has taken them to locations such as Stanford University, West Point Academy, the Smithsonian Institute, the Naval Academy, and the Kennedy Center, and now the MHS. So please join me in welcoming John Brancy, Peter Dugan, and Peter Drummy. The sunburst of glory when the boys come home. The days will seem brighter when the boys come home. And our hearts will be lighter when the boys come home. Hearts and sweethearts will press them in their arms and caress them. And pray God to bless them when the boys come home. Ranks will be proudest when the boys come home, and our cheer will ring the loudest when the boys come home. The full ranks will be shattered, and the bright arms will be battered, and the battle standards tattered when the boys come home. Their bayonets may be rusty when the boys come home, and their uniforms be dusty when the boys come home. But all shall see the traces of battle's royal graces in the brown and bearded faces when the boys come home. Our love shall go to meet them when the boys come home. 
11 o'clock, November 11th, armistice signed. Kaiser in Holland and Crown Prince passed over. This was the day of all days that I wanted to be in France to see the celebration and I had to stay in the canteen so that I never heard a church bell or a single thing except one cannon. Um, when that went off at 11 o'clock, all the soldiers cried out, c'est la paix, c'est la paix, la guerre est finie, and con continued to eat their meals. No throwing up of hats, no singing of the Marseillais, nothing. France is too sad, and the price it has paid, had to pay is too great to have any real demonstration of joy. There is no joy here. It is simply an awful relief to have the slaughter stopped. That is all. They have felt more like crying than celebrating, and I think that most of them did. This is from the journal of Margaret Hall, um, a Red Cross volunteer serving with the French army um, at a canteen on a river crossing on the Marne um, at the end of the First World War. Um, what we have, and this is her account that's on display in the next room, what she did in assembling from her memoir, her diaries written during the war, a memoir, she illustrated with photographs she had taken during the war. And this is the photograph she chose to have facing um, her account of the armistice. Very different from how um, we understand the celebrations that took place here in the United States. It's not that there weren't celebrations here in Europe. Here is um, Bastille Day in 1919 in Paris, where an enormous um, uh, pile of um, German weapons has been assembled. But more um, often in Europe, the end of the war is um, simply felt to be this point of exhaustion. As um, uh, uh, Mar Margaret Hall wrote in her journal, that this could be anywhere in the battle zone, these um, graves um, scattered through the landscape. Um, one thing to remember in thinking about um, the United States participation in the First World War, that it begins before the actual entry of the United States into the war by declaration of war in 1917, that there is an enormous sympathy um, for France another republic, also this idea that France had supported the United States during the American Revolution, and this was the opportunity to repay that. So many Americans volunteered to serve um, with the French army. Uh, the, the France recruited far, foreign volunteers, so these are people, for the most part, who joined the Foreign Legion and served in France. So many young men did this that um, in the um, uh, memorials of um, Harvard graduates killed in the First World War, there's a whole volume devoted to um, uh, young men who died before the United States formally entered the First World War. And we're gonna hear a little bit more about one of them. Just, <clears throat> just wanted to mention that the there he is. That the piece we did first was written by an American named Oli Speaks. Um, you could hear it had that cheerful notion of the end of war, um, which, of course, as we heard from that um, selection that you read, uh, of course, it's not really the way it went down. So this next piece is going to be a bit more somber. Um, this poem was written by Alan Seeger, who is one of these American men who was already fighting uh, with the French Foreign Legion before the U.S. had actually entered the war. Uh, Alan Seeger came from, was part of a very musical family. Um, Ruth Crawford Seeger is one of the great American composers of the 20th century. Pete Seeger, his nephew, was one of the most important folk musicians. Um, so uh, Seeger wrote a poem called I Have a Rendezvous with Death and is fairly well known now. He wrote it during World War I, and it's this sort of eerie premonition of his own death because Seeger would, in fact, be killed in battle. Um, this particular musical setting was composed for John and me by my older brother, Leo Dugan, and we premiered it 
in New York in this past April. Uh, but this is the Massachusetts premiere of I Have a Rendezvous with Death. Maybe he shall take my hand and lead me into his dark land and close my eyes and quench my breath. It's maybe I shall. Some scarred slope of battered hill. When spring comes round again this year, and the first meadow flowers appear. God knows twere better to be deep, pillowed in silk and scented down, where love throbs out in blissful sleep, pulse nigh to pulse and breath to breath. Hushed awakenings are dear, but I've a rendezvous with death at midnight in some flaming town. Trips 
while we're speaking this evening and hearing music that focuses on the role of Americans in the First World War, it's important to remember that this, in fact, as it's called the Great War by people who participate in it, but um, in fact is a war that's fought everywhere in the world, in East Africa, um, in, um, uh, throughout Europe, on all the oceans. Um, but even within the United States, there is a broad participation of people um, in the war effort. And this is um, uh, an attempt to um, focus on the um, flags of the countries who fought as part of the Great Alliance, the Allies. Um, there, um, is, it's also important to remember how um, foreign literature affected and, and music created elsewhere um, uh, play, was played here and performed here. And um, especially the um, music that is associated, the poetry and music associated with um, uh, remembrance of those lost. This is the um, cemetery constructed at the end of the war and the Argonne Forest, the um, enormous cemetery where um, the bodies of almost 30,000 American soldiers were brought together. Um, it still exists. It's an important cemetery. Many, many families had the, re the remains of their loved ones returned to the United States, but there are still, I think, approximately 18,000 Americans buried there. The scale of suffering is simply extraordinary. For the European countries, four and a half years. Um, it's also important to remember that while the United States was only an, an active participant as a nation in the war for a relatively brief period of time, approximately 18 months, the scale of casualties, especially in the last uh, months and weeks of the war, is staggering. Uh, Massachusetts lost the state of Massachusetts, which then had a population of about three million, lost about the same number of soldiers who have been uh, killed since 9-11 um, fighting in the wars in the Middle East, the entire country's um, rate of loss. Um, it's also the case that um, there are many Americans, as speaking before, who volunteered to fight um, with France, there's also an, a very large number of um, U.S. citizens who both before American entry into the war and even after American entry into the war um, go to Canada to enlist in the Canadian Army, um, especially people who were passed by um, by conscription or failed to um, their um, uh, uh, physical tests would go and enlist in Canada. So the connection of Canada and the United States in the First World War is a very close one. Um, as heavy as the losses are here in the United States, it's important to remember that Canada, with about 10% of the population of the United States, suffered about the same number of casualties as the United States did in the First World War. Like you're, you couldn't be setting us up better, Peter. It's like we planned this out. Um, so <laughs> the connection between Canada and the United States, um, we're going to speak for a minute about probably the most popular poem from that time period, at least during that time period, and that is In Flanders Fields, which was written by a Canadian named John McRae. And he was a doctor, he was also a soldier, and um, he wrote this poem at the burial of a friend of his, and he was struck by how quickly the red poppies would begin to grow over the tombs, uh, the burial sites of, of these soldiers. And the poem, the, the final stanza of the poem is fairly patriotic, and partly for that, even though it begins very with this pastoral imagery, um, so partly for that reason, it became very popular. Um, and it was actually an American professor uh, who had an idea at the end of the war to uh, use the poppies, which had become popular from this poem, 
use it as a symbol of remembrance. Now that symbol has sort of been lost. It's not as well known in the United States anymore, even though it did technically begin here. Um, now it's, it's very well known as a sign of remembrance in the, especially the Commonwealth countries. Um, and so this poem in Flanders Fields was set to music by America's maybe most iconic composer of the time, Charles Ives. And he uh, is famous for combining popular tunes, band tunes, in all kinds of unexpected ways. Uh, so when you hear this setting, which he composed in 1917, I believe, of, um, in Flanders Fields, you'll hear at one point the piano has, my country tis of thee. And I play the entire melody which you may or may not realize because John is doing something totally different at the same time. Um, and one last thought on this, uh, we have actually, we're next month, or yeah, in a couple of weeks, we're going to be performing a new musical setting of In Flanders Fields, which has been commissioned. Um, by the government of Flanders, Belgium. By the government of Flanders. Leonardo Dugan yeah. uh, will actually have a, create a new treatment of the poem and it will be premiered at the Kennedy Center 100 years after, after the end of the war. So for now, we, we're not allowed to perform that for you yet, but, um, <laughs> but for now, here's Charles Ives. Shell shock. Um, this is Margaret Hall, the person who I read passage from her account of um, the armistice um, at the beginning of the program. She is someone who spent a great deal of time thinking about what the war meant and how it had affected her as a person. She um, um, 
opens the transcription of her diaries with this passage um, from Kipling, which is very powerful, um, but in also striking that she, as good a writer as she is, she feels the need to use someone else's words to describe her feeling connected with the war. Somewhere over there, that is where she's serving, the thing will suddenly grip your throat and your heart. It will take hold of you as nothing in your life has ever done or ever will. Um, I think this is the experience of soldiers in war. And it's also the case the First World War presented um, unusual circumstances for both fighting. Um, uh, after the war ended, Margaret Hall systematically documented by photography the entire length of the Western Front. And she was um, especially interested in documenting how that um, the um, battlefields had essentially been turned into a moonscape. Um, one thing she saw among the soldiers that she assisted um, um, where she served was evidence of this sort of powerful effect of the war upon them. Interestingly, um, and this is about the only thing I'll show you this evening that's not from our collection, um, in some respects, um, uh, Germany, both the German army and the German population in terms of the sort of po propaganda effort going on there, um, um, were more honest about the war effect. Uh, a German poster for war relief is much more likely to show <coughs> a wounded veteran with an artificial limb than you will find in the, among the allied countries. I, I show you this um, poster um, while it's um, for a patriotic purpose, um, help us to victory. Nevertheless, this is what in a later war of the 20th century will be described as the 1,000 yard stare the kind of vacant view of war veterans. And this is something that started to be, appear to um, both uh, uh, people within the military, but especially um, uh, people involved in the treatment of um, the um, uh, injured, especially people who had um, uh, psychiatric injuries. And a person who writes about this in a very powerful way is a physician from Boston, um, Harvey Cushing, who has come to Boston to, before the First World War to found the Peter Bent Brigham Hospital, but is a neurosurgeon. And he's someone who pays close attention to the uh, psychiatric effects of the war and the physical um, 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 results of psychiatric damage. And um, he, in his extraordinary diary, um, gives an account, um, uh, essentially um, a case history of a young American soldier who arrives in France in May and by um, September of um, uh, 1918 is blind, uh, blinded by the effects of not physical injury but what he's been exposed to. Um, but um, uh, Cushing tries to sort of figure out what has happened. They're using the term shell shock because they're associating this with the very heavy bombardment of both um, uh, explosive and gas shells um, during the war. Also that people are in trenches where they have no means to escape from this and how people um, are associating this with cowardice where, uh, where it appears to be for people looking at this from a medical perspective is something that's sort of almost an inescapable um, uh, effect of this essentially industrial war. And now to hear about a, an interesting example of someone and how he dealt with this, our next piece. This is Ivor Gurney. He uh, was a young man when he entered the war and uh, turned out to be an incredible poet and composer. Many of his songs are still uh, unearthed. Uh, this next piece that you're going to hear was actually written in a trench. So you can imagine 
all of the chaos happening around him as he was writing these, writing the music for this song. Yeah, the, the piano part at the end of the song you'll hear has a particularly bombastic quality to it. He had a particularly rough experience. Um, it's possible that he was already predisposed to some sort of mental illness. We're not really sure. But what we do know is that he was um, shot, I, I believe, in the leg and left to, you know, have that <laughs> fixed up, however, however that was happening. And then he went right back to the front um, and then got gassed. So, you know, it's just just an awful, awful experience, which we can't really imagine. Uh, uh, certainly, John and I can't. But, um, but, but unlike some of the other composers who fought, uh, he lived and uh, continued to write in uh, insane asylums as he. Yeah, he never really made the transition back to, to normal life. Yeah. Um, but insane asylums for the rest of his days and um, always writing, always creating poetry, always creating music. Very, very interesting um, and worthwhile to explore his, his poetry as well as his music. So here's Ivor Gurney by Beer Side. a sacred city built of marvelous earth. Life was lived nobly there to give such beauty birth. Beauty was in that heart and in that eager hand. Death is so blind and dumb. Death does not understand. Drifts the brain with dust and soils, the young limbs glory. Death makes justice a dream and strength a traveler story. Death makes the Most grand. 
Before we hear um, the work of one of the most illustrious immigrants to the United States during this period, I thought I'd say just a little bit about how um, it's important to think of the period of the First World War as essentially the time where the, by percentage, um, the greatest percentage of um, people living in the United States were either foreign born or the children of um, immigrants. That this is a moment where people have connections with um, the rest of the world, where people are coming from to America from places that never came from before. There were many countries where we now know um, many immigrants come to the United States today, where if you go back to the federal census from 1910 or 20, or the Massachusetts census from 1905 or 15, you'll find that more um, people are born at sea than uh, come here from countries um, um, in Africa or the Middle East. Nevertheless, this large number of um, recent immigrants connected the United States to things happening elsewhere in the world. That, for just as an example, um, and the elections following the end of the war, um, uh, um, people running for office here in Massachusetts had to, running for office, had to say where they stood on independence for Ireland, on um, whether there should be um, a Jewish state in Palestine. These are um, arguments that are made in uh, political life here. There's also an enormous sympathy and effort to um, send aid to places that are either directly affected by the war or where the war has um, displaced people or caused secondary damage. Um, the, um, uh, uh, in the um, um, hyper-patriotism of the period of the First World War, things become complicated. Um, um, all of us, I think, know that to be German or to have a dachshund was, in fact, to put yourself essentially at an enemy camp. The, um, uh, conductor of the Boston Symphony Orchestra was essentially forced out of his position because he was German um, by nationality. Um, but at the same time, that was when I didn't intend, um, it's, it is the case that there is this idea that this enormous immigrant population can be um, caught up in the um, uh, war effort. And I think this is one of the most remarkable of these um, uh, patriotic posters in our collection to sort of call attention that we are all here um, um, as uh, Americans together. And now we'll hear a little bit about um, um, someone who arrived, I believe, on the day after the armistice in 1918. Right. Sergei Rachmaninoff, have anyone, has anyone heard of him? Yeah, so um, Rachmaninoff arrived in New York on, on November 12th of, of 1918, and he had fled Russia during the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917, and had been a sort of wanderer for about a year, and um, part of the program that John and I uh, have been performing, this um, armistice, The Journey Home, focuses on this idea of wandering after, after a conflict or a trauma or a war. And um, so not only does that apply to soldiers who have to find their way back home, but also to someone like, like Rachmaninoff or, or a refugee, uh, someone who, who's fleeing. And if, you, if you're interested in hearing more of the Armistice program, little plug here for tomorrow, tomorrow night uh, at, at the Boston Conservatory, we'll be doing the full program. Um, so do you want to just say what this song is? Yeah, about? the song is called Spring Waters. And it is, uh, we, we, on the program, we put three songs together that basically all have to do with one's own journey. They're, the first one is I wait for thee. So there's somebody waiting uh, for a person to come home or come back to them. And then uh, I, the, the second one is um, how, how fair this, this place, how fair this spot. And 
That one is about sort of a content state of being, where you are, and finding that, that inner peace, but also still longing for something. And then this is about the coming of spring and life and renewal of life and how life always kind of comes back around and brings with it many gifts. Yeshov palach biel yetzniak Avol di ushviyos noy shul miyat Yelgut ipul datzol nibriak Yelgut ible shuti glasiat Ani glasiat ba Wirs na idiot, wirs na idiot, mi mala doi wirs ni ganzi, ananas wischlala. Goodbye, France. This is actually, hello, France. This is American troops arriving in France. But one thing when we think about the First World War is this is the first time that many Americans go anywhere in the world. Two million men and tens of thousands of women went to France over the period of about 18 months. Some people more or less arrived just about when they and departed only a short time thereafter, arrived just before the armistice and departed soon thereafter. The, uh, ironically, the troops who had the most combat experience, who had been there the longest, were kept in France um, guarding um, uh, 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 places where they had secured um, passages over the Rhine River into Germany in case the war started up again. It didn't, but it meant that um, long service soldiers actually remained in France until the spring of 1919. Nevertheless, um, uh, people came home to triumphant parades. We'll see on Wednesday, but until um, then, um, the greatest parade in Massachusetts in Boston history, certainly, if not Massachusetts history, was held in the spring of 1919 when the New England National Guard, the Yankee Division, returned to Boston, um, marching all together. And this is um, months after the end of the war, but there's still enough enthusiasm for these ideas, this cause they had fought for, so that to get the whole division marching in Boston at the same time, they marched from downtown, essentially out here, <laughs> 
Um, there's photographs of um, the, um, what's now the Berkeley Performance Center that then was a dance hall with the soldiers marching right down here at the corner. Then they marched all the way back downtown and then back out along uh, Commonwealth Avenue and back on Beacon Street so they could all be marching at the same time. Anyway, it's this extraordinary event um, in the spring of 1919. Nevertheless, um, things had already started to go wrong. This idea that something positive could come from this essentially what in, at that time was re often referred to as a holocaust that had happened in Europe um, um, was thought to be slipping away as the peace at the end of the war was negotiated. In our collection we have um, the papers of Charles Story, who as a young man was assigned to the um, Bureau of Political Intelligence, people who were preparing for the negotiations in Paris. And only a month after the end of the, after the armistice, um, what, before the negotiations even begin, he writes in his diary, all the time we have been here, I have been unable to get any clear statement of our ends in this conference, there has been a total lack of definiteness, definiteness in what the 14 points, that's Wilson's 14 points, actually mean when applied to a given situation. I have felt that we have been drifting, waiting for the president to come and put a concreteness in his abstract propositions. It is, of course, a costly business, and we have lost much that is priceless. Aside from the loss of certain points, which we should have had, we have lost a more substantial thing than any single concrete point. We have lost the confidence of our allies and our political wisdom. They have always thought we were children at the game. Now they know that we come to the peace table with four hearts and a diamond up our sleeve. As Benish, the future prime minister of Czechoslovakia said, you have a purpose, have you a plan? They know we have no plan and that if we are given the form of that for which we have fought, we will go home like children, happy in a toy and let them have the substance. From now on, therefore, it is the object of them all to take the cake away and leave us the candles. Well, this is a pessimistic way to end, but um, we'll um, celebrate the return of peace and normalcy to America um, with their next piece. Thank you. Uh, before we close, uh, of course, first of all, thank you Peter and, and Catherine and Gavin and everyone from the Historical Society staff, but especially Peter, thank you for sharing your wisdom. Um, and also thank you to Michael Shin and, and the Boston Conservatory for helping to bring this collaboration together. Uh, we're just very pleased to be here. And we wanted to just briefly uh, mention what, what's in the back of the room. You may have noticed as you, as you came in. Uh, once the lights are up, you'll be able to see better. But that is a rendering of what will become the first World War I monument to exist in Washington, D.C. Uh, we don't have a World War I memorial in, in the Capitol at this point, and um, it's currently being built. The ground has been broken, and that is the design. It'll be at Pershing Park on the Mall. Um, and uh, you can find out more information uh, when you look up the World War I Centennial Commission. So, um, yeah, we're, we think it's, uh, it's a pretty cool piece and, and it, an important reminder to have there in the capital of a war that is often overlooked or forgotten uh, in this country. So, with that, we come to the final piece of the, of the program. And this is written by another Russian immigrant to the United States, Irving Berlin. I can picture the boys over there Making plenty of noise over there And if I'm not wrong It won't be long till a certain song will fill the air It's all very clear The time's drawing near When they'll start marching down to the pier 
Singing goodbye, friends. We'd love to linger longer, but we must go home. Folks are waiting to welcome us across the foam. We were glad to stand side by side with you. Mighty proud to have died with you. So goodbye, friends. You'll never be forgotten by the U.S. They are waiting for one happy day. When the word comes to start on their way With a tear dimmed eye They'll say goodbye But their hearts will cry hip hip hooray The friends that they made Will wish that they stayed as they start on their homeward parade, singing goodbye, friends. We'd love to linger longer, but we must go home. Folks are waiting to welcome us across the farm. We were glad to stand side by side with you. Mighty proud to have died with you. So goodbye, friends. You'll never be forgotten by the USA. Goodbye, friends. You'll never be forgotten by the USA.